So let me jump right in. And uh, Jack, I, I did find it fascinating. You're consistent on calling wars wrong with 40 or 50 years apart, which is pretty impressive to be that consistent over time. So congratulations on that. Um, listen, it's uh, it's been an incredible year, uh, a couple of years. And today the head of the IMF came out and she said she expects a third of the world to uh, go into recession next year and half of Europe uh, to experience a recession. And I don't think that's a major call on her part other than the Europe part. Um, I think it's pretty safe to say that the world's in a tough spot and uh, and we're gonna be in one for a bit of time. I think she also cited that China is facing a difficult year with growth and it's their growth is likely to be at or below the global growth rate for the first time in 40 years. Wow. The second largest economy and uh, as an engine of growth, that's a pretty significant uh, issue. So something we need to just keep in mind and uh, think about. Um, we're living in a world that Larry Summers summed up as follows. I cannot remember previous moments equal or greater gravity for the world. I cannot remember moments where there are as many cross currents as we're seeing today. And I think he's been as right on what's gone on in the economy over the last couple of years as anybody. So today I wanted, I'm gonna to spend more time on the risks than the opportunities. And next week I'll talk more about the opportunities, but I'll touch on both. So let's jump right into it. Stephen, can I just note we, for those in New York, uh, we're gonna do it all at a hybrid. So you, if you're in, in, able to join us at, uh, at Stephen's offices, um, just keep keep, in, keep that in mind. We'll, we'll share more about that later. Go ahead. So the three big risks are geopolitical, economic, and social, but I think the geopolitical ones are kind of at the top of the pyramid. And this is what the U.S. government calls this. Uh, it's the one plus one plus three. It's Russia, China, and then Iran, North Korea, and the terrorist states and, and how we're facing off against them. And I think that, uh, you know, in our in our case, one of the things we got wrong is we didn't think uh, the war would last as long as it did. We didn't think Russia would be as aggressive. Um, and now we're thinking, you know, are they going to whittle down the resolve of the West? And I think that's a big issue that um, is on our minds as the top issue from a Russian perspective. But I think China is the big key for the for the world next year, both from an economic and uh, political and social perspective. I think they're um, how China reopens and how it uh, moves forward is going to really determine how the global economy operates. And I think they're uh, the one of the issues we're going to be facing is how can they manage to work through uh, the COVID issues and still uh, come out of this uh, process. And I think they're the government right now is battling themselves to try and figure out how do you balance the social unrest with the right economic outcome, with the health outcome, all at the same time. And I think they're really well behind the curve there. But I also think this third category of the Iran, North Korea, uh, and the terrorist state issue creates this other element that we're seeing ge from a geopolitical perspective, which we're, we originally thought we're moving to maybe a more bifurcated world between the autocratic and democratic nations. But I think there's going to be three forces with the autocratic and democratic uh, sides aligning with China and the US and Europe. Uh, and then you're gonna have the rest of the world and the rest of the world is gonna be picking off the two groups for everything they can get. And, and that would be the smart thing if you're them. But it also means that the rest of the world is gonna have a, a bigger say in what goes on. And I think a lot of the developed countries and the, and the largest economies think they have going forward because we need their markets and they're gonna play both sides against the middle quite well. I think that's gonna be one of the big geopolitical issues we're gonna be facing. I did think it was interesting, and um, maybe it's a throwaway line, but the, the new Chinese uh, emissary to the US had some very positive things to say. Hmm. I'm not sure if they're trying to start to send a message that maybe we need to partner a little bit better. I think that's the best outcome for the world, but I think we're a ways off from that. Uh, I think they want to see how much uh, they can get away with. I think all nations do, including the U.S., see how much they can get away with before we create this new world order. From an economic perspective, it's obviously the slowing growth and, the, and what happens with inflation. But the social issue, I think, is the one that's going to really rise up this year. And I think uh, Hamlet said it well last week. You're seeing protests in Iran and China, which may have 
a major impact on the Middle East and the rest of the world as we go forward and how that plays out. But, but the other big issues are this cost of living increase that we think is gonna be more permanent going forward. The demographics continue to get worse and we are seeing increased divisiveness around. So let's just jump into a couple of these uh, and see what the looks are on it. So uh, Macro Micro does a, a survey going back in time of geopolitical risk and they this just takes a look at where we are on a global basis. And it's elevated, but really not significantly higher than it's been at different points in time throughout history. Uh, and it's pretty, you know, pretty in line with other issues that we've had that did not blow up the way this has blown up. But if you go into certain areas and regions and look at the geopolitical risk and look at the spike in, in Europe, and you know, you go back to Crimea and then go back really to all the way back to uh, the Gulf War. Uh, to see that kind of uh, spike up. And, and then if you look at the uh, Taiwan Strait and what's going on there in the South China Sea, this is a really incredibly elevated risk level that we're, we're seeing, um, both from China in the blue, uh, uh, the yellow is Taiwan and the red is Hong Kong. So really big elevations from, from that perspective. And then you go to the Middle East and you know the Middle East is the Middle East, it's been, you know, the same way it's been for a long time. And I remember I went to Tri-Cities uh, uh, in Tennessee. I went to Johnson City, <clears throat> Tennessee several years ago. And it was during, right after the financial crisis. And I said, how's the economy here? And they said, it's always the same. And I think when you get to geopolitical risk, the Middle East has always been the same. And until we get um, some better alignment there, I think you're gonna see the Middle East say, staying uh, pretty unstable, but. Uh, some new alignments are forming there that I think are going to be really interesting next year, uh, how that plays out. And then, uh, and then you get to the growth side. And we know that growth is slowing, and we've seen that ag or, again. And if this is a recession, it'll probably be the best forecasted recession in history. Um, the, the odds of recession I saw today from a, a Bloomberg poll where 85% of economists think we're going into recession next year. As you get, start to get the boat leaning that way, maybe the soft landing is more likely uh, um, or a higher probability than we're giving it. But I think we do have some tough sledding here, but slow growth doesn't mean companies don't win. And there is a lot of capital out there. And the, the game is gonna be picking the areas and pockets that are gonna see the growth and that are going to be the beneficiaries of a more persistent inflationary environment. When you think about what's going on in the US, we're looking at wage inflation as a big driver. Our energy prices are, have come down quite a bit. We're not seeing the energy squeeze, but we are seeing a wage inflation squeeze that is uh, more persistent and troubling for the Fed. Where in the Europe, uh, you have a, uh, while inflation's come down nicely, I saw uh, Germany had their inflation number drop from 11.6 in October to 9.6 uh, for December. So a pretty significant drop coming in. Um, I think uh, this is one of the areas I got wrong. I was more worried about the, uh, the ability of Europe and particularly Germany to weather the storm. It's still early, but there are very positive signs coming out of there and how they've been managing this. So I think the inflation coming down there is, uh, is gonna be one where they don't have a big, uh, uh, they don't have as tight a labor market as we have here. It's five and a half percent unemployment or so but they do have uh, much more uh, pressures on food and, and uh, energy. So I think the easing there is a, a real positive sign as we start the year. But I think the, the one issue and uh, Hamlet raised this last week and it's the elevation of social unrest and people are taken to the streets and you're seeing that all over the world, no more so than in uh, uh, Iran and uh, and in China right now, and I think you're starting to see it in other areas as well. But that line trending up is, is worrying uh, for us. And the three month trend in the dark blue line um, is really a sign of something. It means that there's more change coming and more, I think, unrest coming that's going to be very disruptive for governments at a time that they don't really have the bandwidth to provide the support that they've provided in the past. So I think the big questions for next year are, how does the China reopening play out? Uh, there are questions of how many people there are gonna die and what they can afford to have and 
Uh, right now, there's articles about their crematoriums being backed up and things like that. But the China reopening looms large for a lot of areas of the market and for the global economy as a whole. I think the big issue besides China is will the West hold their fate in their resolve to support Ukraine? I don't think most people thought Ukraine would last as long as they did. And uh, in terms of putting up the fight they've put up, and right now it gets to the question of can the West hold its resolve um, or do the problems that uh, each country is facing start to pull away resources and commitment? And I think that's a big element for next year. I think we're getting closer to the peak in inflation and interest rates, and we might have seen the peak in interest rates, but I think inflation is going to be more persistent. I think the market is probably wrong on seeing rate cuts come in next year. I think if there's an area that we're most out of sync with with the market is we don't think that inflation comes down as much, but that it levels off and that the Fed's going to have to reset their 2% inflation level to a higher level. But I think then the other big thing is what does all this mean for corporate earnings and how do they take a hit? And the offset to some of this is the fact that uh, on one hand, you have the dollar weakening and that is will help a lot of multinationals. But on the other hand, you had a lot of companies that were able to raise prices because everyone was raising prices, but now they're not going to be able to hold those price hikes and they're going to start to see and you're seeing that with some of the holiday sales with high inventories and things like that, the discounting that starts to come through. So who can hold their earnings into next year, I think is gonna be the big issue. And I wanna spend time next week talking about the areas we see um, the best opportunities to put capital, but I'll give you a little teaser on that now. And that would be, um, sorry, my screen's a little frozen here. Um, so there we go. Uh, the three big themes we have are these changes in globalization, adjusting to higher rates and the cost of living. And we think this reindustrialization is real, it's happening, and it's moving a lot of capital around the world. I just saw a foreign direct investment uh, study in the US is still at the top of the list there. Again, I think we're seeing capital flow into the US and that's gonna foster our indus industrial base uh, considerably and goes to the Midwest and for the 361 Ohio Tech and other opportunities that we've talked about over the last year, the benefits that are going to uh, accrue to the Midwest are, are real. Michigan, Ohio, and down through the South, we're gonna see a lot of capital flowing. So we think the, um, the reindustrialization of the global economy is going to create some new winners and losers. And a lot of that will be around your access to energy and technology. And I think that's gonna be a big driver for what is gonna propel the US uh, as we move forward. I think the digitalization took a step back last year as companies were using zero interest rates to uh, continue to add cost and, and hire people. And now that they're faced with a higher cost of capital, the need to uh, cut costs through uh, digitalization and through uh, productivity enhancements is really gonna take hold this year. And I think this is the first time companies are really gonna, uh, for some time, take a hard look at their employee base and you're seeing that when the tech companies start cutting back with the cash balances that they have, you're going to start to see it flow into other areas. Fortunately, that'll ease some of the supply chain issues for employment in some of the industrial base, which will allow them to, digital, uh, to get their digitalization and productivity up faster because they're having trouble getting employees in that area. National security still remains at the top and biotech is going to be one of the other areas. And I think the industrial commodity space for a lot of the commodities are going to be very positive next year. And we've seen some of the companies get and some of the commodity prices get sliced pretty hard. But we think that this is still a favorable environment for them. So I'm gonna focus on that. But I think this is a period where we have to focus on who wins in a reset cap structure. And this is gonna be where balance sheets matter and earnings matter, not multiples. And in our view, you can't count on multiples going forward. So Mark, I'm gonna stop there and open it up. Wow, Andrew, you're just beating everybody to like Rob Collarina. You, you, you put the hand up fast. Go ahead. Go ahead. Who's up? Andrew. Thanks, Stephen. Um, with that, with avoiding the trying to avoid the third rail of politics, there's a lot of talk about going into a recession next year, and it just seems like we're already meeting the criteria of a recession. So are, aren't we technically in one? 
And if so, um, why aren't they telling us? Um, you got the first part right with your first part of your question. They're not telling us because of the, you know, one, they're, they're not sure yet. Um, we're right. likely in a recession, but they're not going to call it until they know that we're in one. Um, I think the issue that we're facing here is, uh, is one where the politics will matter, but the government's shot a lot of their bullets. They did put programs in place that we think are going to drive capital, whether it's the Inflation Reduction Act, which is completely misnamed, but um, still will move capital into the US into key areas. And we think the CHIPS Act are really gonna be very positive opportunities for regions and for not just the tech industry or the chip industry, but for the steel industry and a lot of others in the US. So I think this is just one of those times where the economy is gonna be crappy. We're probably seeing a series of rolling recessions already, which is why they might not call it that. Um, and if you look through what we've seen over the last year, that it was the services that got hit. Now the services are picking up and the goods are getting hit. And I think you're seeing industry after industry start to go through or come out of their different periods of recession. So I think this is one of the more complex environments to call it an actual recession. But I mean, everyone thinks we're in one, so I don't think it really matters as much. Um, what I think is going to matter is what pockets um, are going to win in this environment. I think that it's going to be very narrow. And I, to that point, Anurag, you're sitting in Silicon Valley. You know, my wife works for Google. The tech layoffs, or, or well, actually not Google mm -hmm. per se, layoffs, but have been fairly massive. Um, how would you describe Silicon Valley's view of, and it will be out there in April, of a, of a recession? Uh I'm a little hesitant to speak for the entire valley, but in the clutch of people I find myself, um, I would say that we believe we're in a recessionary environment right now. But I mean, what so what is what what's the implication of that for tech and for Silicon Valley? I think it's a, it's mixed. Uh, there are companies that are hurting. Tw Twitter is in a bad spot just because of structural reasons. The way uh, Elon bought that company. Is going to put a lot of pressure on them. So he's got to increase revenue and cut costs because he's got a massive debt load. I don't think that's necessarily tied to macro factors. I think that's a very specific micro situation. I think a lot of the other tech companies are somewhere on the spectrum between, um, I'm going to butcher the saying, but what's the saying? Like never let a good crisis go to waste. So it's an opportunity to lay off a yeah. lot of folks. Um, you know, I've jokingly said in the past, but I actually think I mean it. You could line up uh, all the employees at the major tech companies in Silicon Valley, and if you randomly fired the fifth, every fifth person, these companies wouldn't miss a beat in terms of performance. Um, <laughs> it's part of the it's a part of the issue of being a quasi monopoly, um, you know, the, which a lot of network effect businesses uh, give you, right? So you end up like a government agency or or, or a college campus where there's just a lot of functionaries um, and. Uh, the thing that that Silicon Valley worries about the most is not a recession. Uh, it worries about competition. And I think that what are the, a lot of these companies are going to have to deal with are some of the disruptions. I mean, GPT-3 is probably a bigger issue for Google right now uh, than the recessionary environment, just given their, their market position until someone comes along and unsettles it. But look, the, like now coming back out to 50,000 feet, um, certainly on the capital side, I think people are affected. You're seeing less deployment of money. Um, the, the valuations in 20, second half of 20 and all of 2021 were really bubblicious. And I think you're going to see a bunch of quality companies come back out to market toward the end of this year and in 2024, because they were able to stretch out their burn rates, do the 10% cut started doing it last year in, in the name of kind of letting go some of the lower performers um, and really and then change some of their business initiatives. So kind of really stretch out that cash, those big war chests that they raised. Um, but I think you're going to start to see some real pressure there when they go out to raise money. So hopefully that that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, more nuance. For, it's like I played, you know, anyway, I, the, for your first appearance, you've done Perfectly well, uh, thank you. <laughs> and uh, there is a re next week uh, at 11:30 is a VC reboot deep dive uh, that Joe Milam. Uh, do you want to pile onto that, Joe? 
um, and I, my, my side question for you is, is for a $7 billion pension fund, San Jose, what percentage is in venture? We're tiptoeing back into venture. It's about, uh, we have two plans. I don't know my sister plans exposure, but I think we're roughly in the 6% range. Okay, interesting. Joe, you want to any chime in on what you just heard? Well, I I think the the Stephen has continues to do a great job in framing the macro backdrop. I go back and just this has been well covered for years about the nominal returns available on publicly traded securities has been driven largely by the Fed policy, the absolute returns that were available. And that tailwind is gone. And so where can fiduciary led uh, pools of money, like what Anurag's involved with, but foundations and, and others, get a decent nominal return. And that's going to be in those assets that have not been financialized, right? Supported and elevated prices elevated by easy money. And the most inefficient market has been and remains early stage venture. The problem is how do you deploy capital well and treat it like an asset class? And so for me, the, the, the answer still always points back to um, deploying, creating venture as an asset class, not an access class, right? Hot deals and who's got in-network access to purported or perceived hot deals and treat it like an asset class so that you're, you, can, you can actually capture the nominal returns because the venture asset class is largely, if it, if it weren't for the behavior um, of the investors, um, the whipsaw behavior of the investor side of the, the, the relationship, entrepreneurs are largely insulated from a lot of this macro stuff. Innovation isn't largely affected by this macro um, picture that we're all concerned about, and rightfully so, uh, except for access capital. So if capital could flow, the um, the asset owners, of the capital employers would be rewarded well by deploying to the earlier stage asset class if they could do it well. And obviously, that's what we'll be talking about, how to do it well at scale. And and even though you came on camera, Mariana, I have to keep, stay on. You know, Lauren and Rob had had their hand up. You'll have that that opportunity. There, there's a there's someone looking for some of that flow in London with Mariana. The Lauren, since we haven't, I think his hand was up for you, Rob. Uh, and you have we haven't seen you in months, so go for it. Uh, Steve, yes. a couple of questions. One, this uh, investment that's coming to the Midwest, does any of it reach? Uh, you could say the western edge of the Midwest, like Chicago and Iowa and, and Missouri and places like that. And also, uh, when you're talking about recession, you know, I you, you guys, I guess, know, I kind of even look from stuff from, you could say, the streets. But BBC World yesterday was running a lot of stuff from Australia and Canada that was talking about a really severe labor shortage for, like, you know, labor you know, truck drivers, HVAC, repair people, you know, waiters, you know, to the point where they're like offering like cash bonuses and plane tickets to get people to relocate to these places. So I'm just wondering if you have any view on how the, what is still perceived as a labor shortage. Cause like I say, from the street, everybody in my neighborhood says is, look, if you want a job, you can get one. You got social service agents. That's one of the measures I use social service and social justice agencies that I know that have like jobs six eight months unfilled completely unheard of right so what do you what do you think Steve I think the labor markets around the world are tight and will remain tight and the we have a, a an availability and a skills issue that is all over um you you're, you should expect to see tight labor markets for a while which is going to keep the inflation Pressure and a lot of attention to productivity enhancements, whatever that is. It's going to force companies to spend on productivity, to keep their labor costs down. Mental and mental go up with the wage bill. They need to manage the total wage compensation for the organization, and they'll bring that down through productivity. Rob, Rob Colarina. Yes, great. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, you mentioned uh, Silicon Valley, and I think a number of folks, I'll be in San Francisco and Silicon Valley next week around J.P. Morgan Healthcare. Um, I'm not sure if Mark even are, thought about something on the you, side of that. Are you going to be on Davos? Uh, if, if 
it's it's kind of on the uh, it's it, it, it it's on there, but it's it's uh, I'm, I'm, I'm more with... domestic focus for this one, and, and and hopefully Florida here later in the month. But uh, with but here are things. No hopeful. But, uh, my my question. No hopeful. You're, you're, we're going to see you in Florida. Right? Yeah, I'll I'll see I'll see you there. All right, thank you. I'll see you there. My my question, Steve, was a little tech related, but um um. Do you think the folks who went into Tesla and even SpaceX, um, did they sort of price the fact that Elon may be, you know, uh, you know, he may be sort of unpredictable and he may have gotten into like Twitter or some other, you know, type of venture, you know, this this loss of what what is it, two hundred billion, um, you know, it, it is what it is. But um, I mean, how how do you think that's played out, and um, are there lessons learned, or you you think sort of Elon's going to be Elon and and things will you know, b both value and um, and um, both personal and corporate value will we'll come back. Steve? Uh, there's a lot back in that question. That's what Rob does. <laughs> um, listen, I think, I think when we had zero interest rates, um, a lot of things looked really good and worked. And we're moving to a different rate and structure that is going to make things much more difficult for everybody. Um, and I think that's the biggest thing that, whether you're in private markets, public markets, venture, doesn't matter. We're moving from a zero interest rate environment to a much higher interest rate environment, whether it's three, 4%, and that changes the values, valuations on everything. And I think that that's what we're dealing with. You do have these cults of uh, personality like Elon Musk and, you know, I think, how you value Tesla is, is a real challenge. And uh, I think that that's why the people are so well over the board on it. Um, I think a lot of people got burnt by just following along. Uh, I think, Joe, this is one of your big themes of uh, you know the world. It's, it doesn't matter if it's public markets or private markets. We were lemmings er, uh, throughout. And I think uh, now you're getting back into fundamentals again, and we're going to be looking at businesses based on earnings, and you're not going to be factoring in multiple expansion right now. You're going to be just factoring in, can they earn more the next year, and will it exceed what the expectations of the street are? And I think that's going to be throughout the whole industry, and I think that's the world we're facing. I hope that answers the many elements of your question, Rob. Yeah, I mean, it just... To just a quick footnote. I mean, Steve, that was, you know, sort of interest rate driven. I, I think some of this is fundamental to use of time and bandwidth. So, you know, that's where I think some of the um, either there's a correction or it's a sort of a new model. So I just I just you know, I, I think some of it is less sort of economics, but more of use of talent. Yeah, I think it, in his case, it's a very <clears throat> specific issue for, for Musk. I mean, as brilliant as he is and there's no disputing that. I think he might have stretched himself a little bit on this one. Um, and his math wasn't quite as good as it should have been on Twitter. Um, so we'll have to see. But I think I think it's going to I think it gets to the part where people actually start to think a little bit differently about the cult of personalities and about the depth of management and companies. You know, we we've been talking about is, is due diligence, the return of due diligence. Um, we were talking with someone who sits in Riyadh, um, and they're, you know, there's so much money there, and yet they're, they're looking at how, you know, they gave money to the, let's just say, large private equity, and it wasn't strategic, and now they're seeing what's happening, and they're, they're trying to go up a learning curve, and they're also, we were talking about how, trying to help, like, the NFL athletes, truly, what we're trying to, they're like, they, they also, sitting in Riyadh, need education and part of that education is proper due diligence um that there should be i mean joe that, that's got to be part of of your message right um and you can't trust you know names yeah. you have to trust discipline and processes process and and if you look at the research i mean this is sort of a coming attractions but you know, more due diligence or better due diligence, which is what all the hoopla is about right now, given the FTX at all, is actually a, is, is like a straw man distraction because the capital deployment process uh, is actually where most of the uh, risk it needs to be managed. 
proper diversification in your venture fund, proper capital deployment over multiple rounds. And so, yeah, it's process is more relevant, but the the, the highest value or the, the, the lowest hanging fruit of alpha is in the venture portfolio structure, which includes deployed capital over multiple rounds and proper diversification. And then base your decisions on data, not on the cult of personality, right? So. Yeah, uh, we if, if Riyadh needs help with the education part, we can educate them on what's going on here. I know it's a different level of education. Um, I hear you. I feel you. Uh, other questions, comments? Mark? Yes. Andrew. Sorry, I don't seem to have a raise my hand button. <laughs> <laughs> you do. You just don't know how to use it yet. But I, we'll... I tried four times. Yeah. Anyway, all right. Enough of that. Uh, Stephen, um, a lot of the stuff I read, people are like, uh, people, um, firms are pushing bonds for 2023. You know, this is a, you know, bond buying opportunity. Don't go into equities. So, you know, the sidebar there is that, um, loans on, are on one side bonds on the other side, loans are going to be ratcheted up, um, and very, very, uh, expensive for companies to maintain. Uh, bonds have a bit of a um, grace period in the sense that they're longer dated and, and although it's going to be hard to refinance, most of them don't need to um, at the moment. But, uh, you know, rates aren't plummeting. The Fed isn't giving up. Um, what do you what do you see about bonds and, and loans and one versus the other? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm having a hard time getting excited about bonds. I know Duncan is excited about your right. European bonds and uh, high yield. Um, I just saw that they're expecting U.S. high yield uh, to have an increase in in defaults uh, next year. So I, I think I don't I don't think you're going to uh, see a big move up in rates like we saw this year. But I don't know that you're going to get what you need out of bonds other than if you're using it for short term purposes uh, or you have asset liability matching. We're not all that excited about bonds. I'd rather own. Uh, some dividend paying quality dividend paying equity so, move up a little bit, but that's just me. So Andrew Randack, the the second loudest person in Chile at one point. Nineteen ninety nine. Bonds. I um, I'm generally an equity investor, uh, but I think it's hard to ignore two to three year paper of single A down to, you know, uh, double B yielding around six to 7% uh, intermediate term. Uh, companies that have 10, 12, 15 times free cash flow coverage. Sorry for all the noise. I've got three people here in my house today. Hopefully you can't hear that. Okay. Um, the other thing is net issuance of corporates. It was way down last year. So there's a, there is a supply demand imbalance, uh, particularly in the corporate bond world. Uh, there's also a major supply demand imbalance in the treasury world. I, I don't see Bill Deutschler here today, but I would love to hear his theory yeah. on, uh, on what's going on in the repo market. He's usually uh, reverse repo market. He's That's usually right. very astute on, on that front. Um, but banks pushing bonds is banks pushing their own damn balance sheet and inventory. Uh, U.S. major financial institutions in the United States have more than doubled their bond holdings uh, since before the pandemic. They're at something like seven or eight trillion. I, I don't remember where I read it. It was in the, in the fog of post Christmas, pre New Year's. Um, they have huge amounts, trillions of dollars of bonds on their balance sheets that they have to mark to market or get rid of or switch their classification from uh, accounting standard. So they're talking their book. They're trying to sell down their inventory so they can liquefy their balance sheet. Um, so watch out. Uh, I like bonds, uh, but buy them because bonds are good for you, not because it's good for the banks to clean up their balance sheet. Fair enough. Thanks, Andrew. Andrew, I'm playing. I'm playing. You need you in pickleball, so we'll talk about that later. Andrew, are those corporates and munis? Um, good question. I, I'm new to the muni space. Um, I've generally dealt with uh, families outside the United States, but um, but a lot of them have moved onshore in recent years. So I've been getting more into uni, munis. I'm seeing munis. Uh, 
interesting with munis the the capital gain if you buy muni at a big discount this is you know not naive non-muni guy uh that gain when you reach par uh is taxable as a capital gain i believe i'm not a tax expert so it's only the coupon that's going to save you so we've been looking at muni managers that have portfolios very near par and where you're getting your all where most of your return is coupon return not price return uh and um so something I'll, to keep in mind i'll, 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 get, you, I'll get the two of you both went to denison by the way uh, a muni room awesome uh, wanda, wanda but I'm, I'm still learning munis i'm still new to it so um but there's some good stuff out there the taxes tax equivalent yields are very similar to corporates uh that are lower rated so um so i think munis are interesting wanda I'd like to switch gears uh, a little bit. Today, Congress is selecting, hopefully, the Speaker of the House. It is predicted that that is very unstable Congress. It's going to be unstable Congress. So question to Stephen. Um, should we even look at what's going on in politics? Is it a meaningful uh, noise or if it, what what will be meaningful? What should we look for in the next uh, political moves? That's a good question. Uh, I, I think they've, from an economic perspective, I think they've done most of what their contribute contribution is going to be for this year. Um, I think there you'll probably see some. Uh, I think the administration's got to figure out how they're going to move their agenda forwards moving into the election already. So I think you're going to start to see them shaping up for 24 with any of their policies. And it's going to be hard for them to get a lot of meaningful stuff done at this point. Um, so I think it's going to come down to what do they do? You know, how, how does the budget and, and all that play out? And what kind of fighting are they going to do around all the different stuff they have? But it's really, we're moving into an election mode now. So I don't think they're going to do much between now and and 2024. I didn't realize. I also want to say, Wanda, um, happy birthday to one of your two main men, Charlie Munger. That is uh, 99th yesterday, I believe. So uh, for your Ohio trip and, and for your Omaha trip, uh, that'll be a big one for him. Wanda, do you want to make a plug for Omaha? Uh, right, so Cinco de Mayo this year will be uh, celebrated by approximately 40,000 happy investors of Berkshire uh, on Saturday, um, the May 5th, uh, I will be there within those uh, 40,000 investors. It's uh, for those who have not been at this event. It is a fascinating event in um, listening to Charlie Menger and his wisdom, his wit, um, looking into and, the... What did he call crypto? Uh, I have forgotten, but he's not high on crypto, but he's high on energy, Chevron and uh, Occidental, which how, are... how do you reconcile that with, you know, uh, with the nuance of, of uh, you know, ESG? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with it because I, I, that's nuance, I'm more, more nuanced. I'm not black and white, but you found uh, comfort in today's um... geopolitical world. So we need a certain amount of energy and transition needs to be planned better. Uh, as far as my personal views go, I'd like to put my capital into work towards transition. So there are energy companies and energy companies. Those companies who really sit under capital uh, for and getting um, quick returns, the time for that is limited because for all practical purposes in investment terms, these are stranded assets. They will be, you know, they will have to be written off the books in five years, 10 years or 20 years. So we need, um, I see uh, Berkshire putting 15% of their portfolio in energy. 
uh, in a meaningful way, which is they are um, enabling enabling transition into this next stage of energy. That's my personal take on it. I'm very much against just quick gains, you know. That's uh, coal mines lost 95% of its value in the last 10 years. It will be very difficult to get money or the capital will be expensive if you want to invest in those enterprises. Yep. I got to say, the, 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 if there was a survey, anecdotally, the most uh, interesting panel was the climate, uh, the energy transition panel, where we actually didn't all agree. I think it's important to have, and thank you, Eddie, for, for, for moderating that. I think I think on that point, and I had actually an offline discussion with Wanda about this. Um, it it uh, it kind of does a disservice if you only have 30, 40 minutes to, uh, it does, it does. to discuss all this. Um, so maybe it's an idea to, um, and I put my hand to, in the in the oh. in the ring here, my head in the ring here. To it's right do here. A, a larger sort of um, uh, topical uh, conversation on this. Yes, it's right there. Great. Adam, you're next. Yes, Stephen, um, back to your presentation on the uh, geopolitical concerns. As you had them listed, if I recall off the top of my, my head, it was Russia, China, then Iran, and other terrorist states. Is that Was that listed in order of priority in terms of um, concern? or uh, I'm not sure on Russia and China. Uh, but definitely the, the Iran, North Korea, and the terrorist states was third. And that was from the uh, Department of Defense last year. Oh, that, okay. That was DOD's concerns in that order? I'm not sure if China or Russia was one, um, but okay. definitely the terrorist states were third. Okay. Um, now that's it. That, that was my question. Thank you, Stephen. Great presentation and happy new year. I, thanks, I, I still think, Stephen, that that every uh, presidential election that uh, the the twenty whatever the twenty forty yeah, uh, scenarios they need to do that every two years or so. Like we can't have to keep up with this. It's tough to you know. But anyways, Miriana. Yes, that's me. Um, can I just show something about longevity? Uh, quite interesting. You want to show share the screen? Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. Right. As long as you're not pitching, all good. No, 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 not pitching at all. It, it's just analysis I did uh, for something I needed to just, and would like to share, actually. And it, it's more and more. Um, I don't know if you can all see it. Let me just yep. Yep, expand. Yep. I cannot expand it. Oops, sorry. Oops. Up at the slide. Up at the slide. <laughs> sorry, I don't need. They're just going uh, randomly. Uh, where is it? Come on, there, yeah. So I did some analysis about um, AI-enabled uh, health and wellness hardware, uh, about products that uh, launched pretty recently and scaled, and some of them sold very quickly, even four years into existence, um, or rather from the launch. And I just wanted to show uh, the trend that uh, many investors are actually not really looking into it. And especially now with the new funds, coming along in terms of longevity and that focus on how can we improve our lives to live much happier and longer is quite interesting. So, um, so dogs, sorry. sorry, that's my dog as well. So I don't know if, if, if you, if everything is clear, so any, any questions there, but it's quite an interesting one. Uh, longevity, that, 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 let's add that to, to our list here. Um, that's something that Prestel uh, has been spending a lot of time on. And uh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you know, of course, that dovetails to, you know, healthy lifestyles and. Um, but overall, health and well-being is something that uh, it's critical focus, especially after COVID, and now that we see what's happening with uh, not only physical but also mental state of human and how everything is interacted. So it's I, I can't wait till we see your pilot. Uh, so we can all experience. I wanted also to comment on that supply chain we speak. We spoke before, actually. Stephen uh, was doing the briefing, and 
so uh, we are obviously at, at the front of all what's happening because we are ordering parts from different parts of the world and one of them uh, is very specific type of um, electromotor that is coming from Japan and that's the only actually place that does that kind of electromotor which can help um, lifting uh, very heavy people as well as very light people so that doesn't really way doesn't interfere with the product itself so and something that used to be three uh, weeks um, lead time is now 12 weeks lead time and it's it's only one of the the components so we are just looking into everything to be locally supplied or uh, any... but there are components that you just can't find anywhere locally so you have to go further out does anyone know what the cost of airfare in and out of china is right now whatever you think it is double it and double it again well similar with container costs um during covid when 40 foot container would cost around 3000 pounds and then uh, during covid just ex exacerbated up to you know 18000 pounds so exactly the same more. goods everything the same so it was just more insane. even more actually yeah you're right other comments questions predictions for 2023 I see you're going to zurich uh that's zurich switzerland i'm i'm assuming right it's not paris kentucky no well there's a zurich uh there's a zurich illinois for, by yeah. the way but, but um Fair enough. okay uh I no, might still know so mike michael sped have you you met michael lauren in chicago hmm. michael's michael sold his company and he's coming on strong we're it, we're, we're doing a little he's heading up uh, 361 europe there'll be london Germany uh, and Zurich, uh, that uh, sort of a regular cycle of events. I might still know some people in, in Zurich if I don't uh, if I don't get it together by November. You'll get it. Duncan, you've come on camera. We were talking about you earlier. You know, not again. I've got so I, I, I thought I was so impressed by what you talked about. I put you back on the schedule. <laughs> um if because you're you're going to come down from vera i'm sure um because now you complete the picture we're going to talk about big picture and inf infrastructure public equity public income fixed income dc private equity secondaries i need you here um i'll be down yeah All right and now what you know you didn't make you, you were we were talking about it steven's not so excited about it Andy Randock, Andrew was talking about munis. Uh, how have you seen it change since November 30? Um, well, I, I think there's a couple things going on. Like it's, look, I, I still go back to my favorite chart, right? And that's the chart of the cash rate over the last 22 years. And, you know, basically the cash rate, the invest, the money you get paid for doing nothing prior to, you know, the last few months has been at, you know, above 4% for 13 months in those 22 years. So people get in habits. And now we're in a world where, you know, I think most people agree that that's just gonna remain tighter rather than go crazy and go to 10%, they're just gonna remain higher. So you're gonna get a return on cash and get a return on, you know, intermediate term government bonds that you can live with. It kind of raises the bar for other things, I think. Um, and I think what's, what I understand is, you know, talking to some of my friends in the States is that, you know, there's a view that the equity investor in real estate and the equity investor in private equity has had a really nice run here. And just more of that cash flow is going to get directed to the lenders for a while. And it's not that everything fails. It's just that, you know, a company that grows at two to 4% or 5% a year, it generates a finite amount of cash flow. And how you divide that cash flow up in the capital structure is changing. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if you're an investor, you know, where do you want to be? Do you want to be the guy that's betting that private equity returned the same number as it did for the last 20 years? Or do you want to be the guy that's the lender and says, I'm getting a safer, secured piece of this on a contracted basis, and it's higher than I used to get? And I'm not saying it's student body left and everybody's going to do that, but I just think it's a more attractive rate. And after the year of, you know, sort of very difficult returns we've had, you know, it should attract more capital. Um, and just, you know, even if you were to like, 
if just pretend you were like, you know, a, a, a fly on the wall at this one of these calls three years ago, right? We'd have been talking about cannabis. We'd been talking about crypto. Mm -hmm. And, you know, on today's call, we're spending a lot of time talking about fixed income, right? So people are paying more attention. Um, so, they, you know, the other thing that's going on is, you know, the banks, as, as it was stated on this call, it's true, the banks are in a little tricky issue. Problem is they own some bonds they don't want because they own things that they underwrote, right? They own, you know, whatever, the, they, they're still sitting on some of these underwritten deals. Um, so, you know, that's, that's clearly an issue. But, you know, the bond math's pretty compelling here, right? If you are a high yield manager and par used to be 100, and now because the market's changed, par is now 85. Now, on the one hand, you, you got to wait for the private equity firm to sell, it, sell the company so you can get paid back. On the other hand, if the <clears throat> private equity company has trouble selling it to private equity company A to private equity company B, that's a bit of an issue. But if he sells it to a trade buyer, instead of just earning two points, you're earning you know, 85 plus 103, the call price, you're going to earn 18 points. And by the same token, since the bond's at 85, if it defaults, your recovery is 40, you're going to lose the 45 points, but you're not going to lose 60 points. So the math is different than it's been for a long time. Um, and so um, anyway, I just think all those things make it really interesting. And I think that, you know, if you've spent 20 years without people paying so much attention to fixed income, unless they had to, I just think it's going to be a place where people can get a contracted return. And the last thing I'll add to it is think about the ways people have tried to replicate cash flow they can count on. You're a pension fund. You're trying to pay the pensioners. You create a laddered portfolio of private equity, of venture capital. You, you've created this like portfolio of funds that are supposed to redeem themselves over a period of time, right? Well, that math's different today than, than what people have probably forecasted. And so shouldn't some of those people say, I want some more contracted returns in my portfolio? I don't know the answer to this, but you know that's kind of my sort of big picture thesis. The last thing I will add is- You, you, just, look at, you just said last thing, last time. Okay. Well, there's just one other theme here that's important for people to think about. You know, um, think about the banking system. Um, the Federal Reserve Bank holds massive amounts of securities, right? They're going to they're going to drain those securities off and they are going to go on to bank balance sheets. And the banks still have really nice cheap deposit bases. Mm -hmm. That's worth a discussion. So what you're saying, we should all go in the financial services sector. Uh, big banks with big deposit bases owning big portfolios of munis and government bonds is a really nice interest spread. They haven't had that in a long time. It was one of the best performing asset classes last year. The second half of the year, it had a huge run because of this. People were starting to smell it. One of the few positive returns of, of an asset class last year.